Okay, I'd like to uh, say something about the nature of the challenge you and I are going to be facing, and say something about the nature of the texts and the construction of the course as a whole. Now, this is a class in epistemology. Epistemology is a philosophical science of knowing. In that respect, it is a knowing of knowing. But it is not just any kind of knowing of knowing. It is a philosophical knowing of knowing. And philosophy is distinguished from all other disciplines by relying exclusively on thinking. So we're going to be engaged not in a cognitive science, not in a psychological investigation. We're going to be restricting ourselves to thinking about knowing. Obviously, there are knowings of knowings that do not rely upon philosophical knowing to consider the character of knowing. And by and large, if we consider the non-philosophical investigations of knowing, they're characterized by two limitations that philosophy by its nature must overcome. One is they begin with some kind of preconception of their subject matter. They don't have anything to address unless the boundaries of their topic are already given. And they don't have anything to address unless they already have an established means or procedure for accessing the subject matter. You know, one sees this in any kind of science of knowing, cognitive science of knowing. That, like the sciences, makes use of observation to address a topic that already has a definite boundary. Right? It's cognition. Cognition as it appears to our observation. Obviously, any of the results that follow from such an inquiry are conditioned or in relative to two assumptions that provide the starting point of that non-philosophical investigation. On the one hand, you have the given boundaries of what presumably cognition is taken to be. Otherwise, you're not investigating cognition. You might be investigating physics or Hindi literature, or mathematics. So in some respect, these sciences have a determinate boundary that is taken for granted. On the other hand, they're relying upon observation. One will think about observation, but ultimately observation will be relied upon. What will not be questioned is whether observation itself is reliable. After all, a scientific inquiry cannot establish the authority of observation. Why not? Circular. It would be circular. It's circular in what sense? You're using the thing you're trying to prove. Yeah, you're using observation. Or you're using evidence given to observation or given to experimental uh, reproduction uh, as if it could be evidence of the authority of observation. But you're having to use observation in this very attempt to scrutinize whether scientific method can be uh, relied upon. By the same token, any attempt to rely upon observation to establish a character of knowing can never provide us with any knowledge of what knowledge necessarily and universally is. Why is this? Well, observations are always of particular observed phenomena. Right? You observe here and now. So that even if you repeatedly observe the same features in the phenomena you address, why can that repeated pattern of observations never allow one to legitimately claim that that pattern holds true necessarily and universally. Why not? Why not? Even, even if over and over again 
if you haven't observed the pattern itself? Well, let's say you're observing a pattern as it appears in particular observations one makes. And what if one keeps on making observations and one encounters over and over again the same pattern? Yeah. You're assuming that the pattern exists at all, and that if it does exist, then it can repeat itself in the future. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, if you're going to claim that it holds true necessarily and universally, you're presuming that it will hold true always. That is, at all times in the past, at all times in the future. Well, you can't observe the future. Can you observe the present in its entirety? What is lacking in observation that makes observation incapable of even observing the present moment? What is true about the present moment? It's always passing. Not just that it's always passing, of course, it's always slipping into the past and the future slipping into the present, but is the present moment the present moment everywhere? Is the present moment observed the present moment everywhere? It's somewhere, to here and now. So even what you ob observe now is observed here, not everywhere. So just as you can't observe anything at all times, you can't observe anything everywhere. So if you're going to make any claims that anything you observe about knowing as it appears, provides one with evidence regarding what knowing necessarily and universally is, you're making a leap of faith. On the one hand, you're not only taking for granted the authority of observation, that the phenomena as they appear to you are what they really are, but secondly, what else are you taking for granted? What are you taking for granted? What are you taking for granted about nature, about the universe, if you will? If you're going to take this leap from commonalities you've observed to the claim that this, these commonalities hold true <coughs> necessarily and universally. Subjectivity? Well, what, what, are you assuming something about subjectivity or are you assuming something more? You're assuming, in a sense, that what holds true in these particular localities and times holds true always, or in other words, you're assuming that one might say nature is uniform. Nature is constant. What holds true in the present and in certain localities holds true everywhere. Can that uniformity ever be established through observation? Why not? You can't observe always. Yeah, you can't observe always. You can't observe everywhere. Well, we are engaged not in an empirical investigation of learning but in a philosophical investigation of knowing. And as always in philosophy, that involves thinking. Now, philosophy is such that knowing is something that philosophy must address. Philosophy, unlike other disciplines, cannot take for granted what knowing to employ, let alone whether or not that knowing has authority. Philosophy cannot take for granted either what its subject matter is or what its methodology should be. These, as you know, if you've had any exposure to philosophy, are matters of continuing controversy. And they're matters of continuing controversy precisely because philosophy cannot take either for granted, it cannot take for granted what philosophy addresses or how philosophy should address its subject matter. Rather, these are themselves philosophical questions that philosophy must investigate and it, through its own efforts, must establish what it should be addressing as well as what knowing it should employ. And to some degree, this is the other side of philosophy's concern with truth without qualification. Philosophy cannot search for truth using thinking if it's going to rest its labors upon unexamined assumptions, if it's going to bow down to any other authority, if it's going to bow down to religious dogma, to 
opinions that happen to be commonly held, to the alleged shared intuitions of a community, to the cultural norms. No, all of these have to be questioned because if one relies upon any such givens, everything that follows upon them has what character? It's relative to them. It's relative to that unquestioned acceptance of these foundations. Philosophy cannot accept any foundations. If it does so, it succumbs to dogmatism. And for this reason, philosophy has to exercise a kind of freedom, a freedom exhibited in the negative sense of having to call into question all assumptions, all givens, and the positive freedom of somehow through its own autonomous thinking generating both its subject matter and how it should address its subject matter. Now, in this respect, what knowing philosophy should employ is itself a philosophical question. Philosophy has to establish the authority of its own knowing. It can't simply take for granted that the claims it makes are valid and that the knowing and procedure it employs is valid. It must itself take up the question, what should philosophical knowing be in order to arrive at truth instead of standing on opinion? So in this respect, you can see that philosophy cannot fail to engage in an investigation of knowing, in particular an investigation of its very own knowing, because it must establish the authority of its own knowing, and it must establish, in a sense, something I've, I've pointed to, which should not be taken up dogmatically, and that is the fact that philosophy makes use of thinking. Philosophy has to legitimate thinking as a privileged vehicle of a knowing a knowing that can be completely autonomous, a knowing that can overcome the relativity of opinion and the acceptance of givens. So philosophy can't help but engage in an investigation of its own knowing, which is a thinking. It must, in other words, engage in a thinking of its own thinking and establish its own thinking is what it ought to be in order to capture the truth. Now, it, admittedly, this inherent requirement that philosophy scrutinize the very knowing it engages in does not, in and of itself, tell us where that self-examination that knowing of, that philosophical knowing of philosophical knowing is to take place in the enterprise of philosophy. Philosophy, after all, is a concern to think the truth. Is not just going to limit itself to thinking the truth of its own thinking. Think what true thinking is. It must also think about objects other than its own thinking. Well, the question is, where is the epistemological investigation that is endemic to philosophical investigation to be found? Is it something that can only be addressed after other things have been investigated? Or must it be something that has to first be examined before any other subject matter can be philosophically determined? Now, in a general sense, if one, one considers knowing, one can think of the knower on the one hand, and that which is known on the other. One can think of this in terms of there being a subject of the act of knowing, and what could be considered the object of that act. Now, when we talk about philosophy being concerned with at some point having to come up with an investigation of its very own investigation, that philosophy must in some respect know that its own 
form of knowing is true and must be able to know that its own form of knowing is true. Otherwise, its whole enterprise is vain and invalid. This would seem to suggest that we have a consideration that is a kind of self-knowing. Because here, what do we have? We have a knowing of knowing where the two knowings are the same. Philosophical knowing must address as its object philosophical knowing and establish what it is and that it is true. And indeed, if it can't establish that it's true, it can't do anything. Right? Its very own investigation of its own knowing must itself satisfy the requirement of what it determines to be. The norms of valid knowing. If philosophical knowing does not meet those norms, if it is not valid, it cannot determine what valid knowing is. It must be a, a valid knowing of valid knowing. And it might appear that in this respect, the philosophical investigation of knowing seems to be one in which the subject, the knower, is identical to the object, or what is known. Philosophical knowing must address itself. Otherwise, it can never do anything with an authority, it might say. Now, on the other hand, if we think of knowing in general, knowing in general would not appear to be just a self-knowing, a knowing of knowing. Epistemology is a knowing of knowing. The kind of epistemology that philosophy must engage in is a knowing of its very own knowing, which, as I've suggested, without giving an account of why this should be, is that the knowing in question is a thinking. A thinking. A knowing that depends solely on thinking, not on observation, but solely on thinking. And in this respect will be a thinking of thinking. But on the other hand, we can think of knowing that is not just about knowing. Right? Knowing, presumably, can know objects different from itself. Knowing can know about nature. It can know about the mind as something that is not just reducible to cognition. After all, what does the mind include besides knowing? What? Well, and you can't fail to be acquainted with aspects of mind that are not simply a matter of cognition. You have feelings, you have emotions, you have moods. Right? You have desires, you have goals, etc. Right? There are all sorts of dimensions of mind that go beyond mere cognition. So in addressing mind as an object, one is not just engaging in epistemology. One is engaging in, in an inquiry into something much more concrete in the process of knowing. Well, presumably, knowing can be about matters different from itself, even if philosophical cognition must, in some respect, confront and address itself and must establish the authority of its own knowing. But on the other hand, we can think maybe more generally that knowing is about an object different from itself. And in that case, epistemology becomes not merely a purely reflexive enterprise, a, a pure self-knowing. Because it is not a knowing of the knowing it engages in. If it, the knowing it investigates were identical to the knowing epistemology engages in, what would have to be true about the character of the knowing it is, a, it is addressing? What would it have to be a knowing of? If the knowing of the epistemologist were to be the same as the knowing epistemology puts under scrutiny. The epistemology is, is engaged in knowing of what? 
Knowing, right? It's the knowing of knowing. Well, if the knowing it investigates is to be the same as the knowing it engages in, the knowing it investigates must be a knowing of what? A knowing of knowing, right? In other words, if epistemology were simply a completely reflexive enterprise, a self-knowing, the knowing it knows would be a knowing of knowing. But we can speak in more general terms of knowing being a knowing not just about knowing, but a knowing of an object different from knowing. And then one might ask, well, what is it that is going on in knowing? And what is it going to secure that there is somehow a knowing at work? Well, in some respect, we have knowing and an object to be known. One may be tempted to regard them as somehow given in distinction from one another. And somehow or other, if knowing is to be achieved, there must be some form of meeting between these two poles of the cognitive relationship. The knower must somehow modify its thoughts, representations, beliefs, however you want to, to characterize the specification of the knowing subject, so that in some respect there is a match, a correspondence, an accommodation with the object. Now one might ask, how is one to account for this? And in some respects, how one is to account for this presents certain fundamental options that equally have bearing upon the place that epistemology has in philosophical investigation, where it takes place. Because one option, if one grants that in some respect knowing and the object of knowing are, are to be thought of as distinguishable, that the possibility of cognition, the possibility that somehow these two poles could come together, that somehow the knower could adequately lay hold of the character of the object of knowing. One might regard that to be something that could only be possible if the object of knowledge, or more generally what is, has a character that allows it to be known. Right? After all, if these, these, these entities are distinct, the object of knowledge has to be such as to be something that will make itself available, that will be susceptible of being taken hold of, be susceptible of somehow fitting into the whole of knowing. So it might be that if we want to investigate what knowing is and how knowing actually operates, we have to turn first to the character of what is of what might be considered in the broadest sense the object of knowledge. And investigate to what extent what is, or possible objects of knowledge, can be such as to allow for their knowability. After all, they might be such as to be inherently unintelligible. They might be such as to be inherently hidden inherently off limits to any kind of cognition. Now in a sense, if this is indeed the case, if indeed in order to comprehend knowing, one has to first address the character of what is. And in that respect, also take note of the fact that what is includes <coughs> knowers. who engage in the activity of knowing. That, after all, could be considered to be part of being in general. Well, it might appear then that we cannot begin with an investigation of knowing. We first must instead begin with a consideration of being, and in a sense, what is most fundamental to what is. <coughs> 
And that alone might be thought to provide a basis for comprehending the particular kind of being that knowers and the process of knowing comprise. And this investigation of being will then provide us with the basis for understanding how knowing could take place. After all, at some point down the line, the investigation of knowing must establish the possibility of knowing. Because otherwise, no investigation of anything could be considered to be plausible. Right? But that doesn't mean that one needs to begin by addressing the knower or the process of knowing. Indeed, it might appear that insofar as knowing is concerned with laying hold of an object in general, one has to first consider the very character of what could be objects of knowing, as well as the character of the knower, as particular aspects of what is, in order to gain some understanding of the process of knowing. Now, this approach, which regards epistemology as not something that can be undertaken straight away, but rather something that can only be undertaken following a more fundamental investigation of what is, is an approach that we are going to be turning to at the outset of our course. And we're going to turn to that approach on the shoulders of two of its greatest exponents, Plato and Aristotle, both of whom comprehend that philosophical investigation must, in some respect, first address what is, first address the most fundamental feature of what is in order to be able to comprehend the nature of knowing. And we're going to begin by looking at one short, complete text of Plato, the Mino, a short dialogue that does not begin by taking up the question of what is knowing or what is knowledge. Plato takes up that question in, in, a, in, a, in a more direct sense in a longer dialogue called the Theotetus, Theotetus, but in the Mino, the discussion begins by raising the question of how virtue is acquired. Socrates is the protagonist of the discussion. Plato, as you probably are familiar, at least in his extent writings, ordinarily makes use of dialogue. And it's important to think about dialogue in reference to the question of knowing. Because what Plato does not do is present his philosophical investigations in the form of an argument coming from one thinker, where that thinker articulates arguments. He avoids that. You might ask, why should he avoid that? Well, what would be the immediate cloud that could hang over such a form of exposition, where we have the author laying out what the author takes to be true? Like one question. Is thoroughness an objectivity? Yeah, in the sense of thoroughness and objectivity, one might claim, in other words, that there's something subjective about what we are being presented with. It's subjective because it is from that individual subject. It is what that subject has to say. And what gives that subject any privileged authority? We could regard what claims are made as to be claims that are relative to that particular viewpoint. Well, Plato will not make arguments in that manner. He will instead present dialogues, dialogues in which you have a plurality of participants. And what will characterize these dialogues is first that there is no omniscient author who comments upon the action. You simply have 
the words of the participants, like a drama. Moreover, Plato is ordinarily not one of the participants. And in the few dialogues where he does appear, he's a young man who plays a very secondary role in the discussion. So instead, what we have is a meeting of minds. Not something subjective, but something we might say is intersubjective, something that involves an interaction among a plurality of thinkers. We see arguments in progress. We are looking, in a sense, at, you could say, a kind of experiment in discussion where things happen as attempts to question and legitimate answers transpire. And in this case, the discussion begins with Socrates uh, turning to consider the question of how virtue is acquired, but quickly the question turns to something more fundamental. First, the question is raised, how can we possibly consider how virtue is acquired if we don't know what virtue is? We need to ask ourselves, what is virtue? But then, in considering what is virtue, a question is raised <coughs> that Socrates considers to be tantamount to being stung by an electric ray. And it's a fundamental question concerning knowing. And that is what we will first be looking at. What is this fundamental question that, in a sense, puts the whole problem of knowledge in potentially dire straits? And what kind of remedy can possibly be provided to allow for the possibility of knowledge. Now this is something that we're going to be looking at in our first readings. Read the part of the Mina that goes up through this discussion. And then on that basis we're going to turn to some further discussions drawn from perhaps the most famous parts of Plato's Republic, the so-called divided line, the myth of the sun, the myth of the cave, or I should say the, the, um, the analogy of the sun, the myth of the cave, where, where Plato, through Socrates' discussion, is going to be presenting some very fundamental notions concerning the nature of knowing. And from here we're going to turn to Plato's greatest student, Aristotle, we studied with him for 20 years before he came to the point of observing there was something lacking in aspects of Plato's account. But nonetheless, Aristotle is going to pursue an attempt to consider the nature of knowing based upon a prior consideration of the nature of being, of what is. And we're going to be looking at some of the basic texts of Aristotle that lay out what is fundamental to this approach, which is one of the fundamental approaches available to thinking about knowing. And we're going to look at some short discussions from Aristotle's metaphysics. First, that consider what, what is the nature of this inquiry that must come first before one can address the character of knowing. And then we're going to take up a part of the metaphysics where Aristotle is going to put forward what he will consider to be a fundamental principle underlying all knowing. A principle that in a sense will be something that Aristotle will attempt to argue cannot be refuted or denied. And that will be the basis for opening the door to a consideration of knowing. And from that, we will turn to Aristotle's account of, in a sense, fundamental forms of knowing that he provides in a work called the Posterior Analytics. But what we will have to confront, then, is the challenge of skepticism, as given its most potent form by the ancient Hellenic Greek, Sextus Empiricus, 
Now, skepticism obviously is something that wants philosophy in general, and in particular, any investigation of knowing. Skepticism in the most brutish, idiotic form would want to deny that one can know. It would want to deny that we can move beyond opinion to any kind of valid knowledge. What is so almost ridiculous about this simple-minded version of skepticism, which purports to know that one cannot know? No, remember, it's making a knowledge claim of its own. It's claiming that we cannot achieve knowledge. We cannot move beyond opinion. We cannot free ourselves of assumptions. We cannot get at anything that isn't relative. It's making a claim that is itself offered absolutely at the same time that it's trying to claim that we cannot know anything absolutely. We cannot have bona fide knowledge. Well. The real skepticism does not make this claim. The real skepticism has a different character, and we're going to have to contend with this much more potent skepticism that Sexus Empiricus is going to engage in, which will not make the claim that we cannot have knowledge, but it will nonetheless be an ongoing practice that will, in a sense, exhibit what might appear to be insurmountable resources that will destroy any attempt to put forward any, well, legitimate knowledge. Now this whole approach to knowing which will want to ground knowing in the character of what is, an attempt to show first that what is is of such a nature that it can't fail to be knowable, and that knowing as part of the fabric of being is something that can land its prey is something that comes into a general kind of critique that is going to lead to the second fundamental way of approaching knowing. And that is an approach that in a sense characterizes the modern philosophy starting from Descartes. And we're going to be looking at three important representatives of this position, <coughs> Descartes, Hume, and above all, Immanuel Kant. And this position is going to, in a sense, be skeptical of the possibility of grounding knowing in any knowledge of what is. Instead, it will turn to the knower as something that one must turn to first in order to establish any kind of authority for cognition. And in a sense, this will be based upon a, what might appear to be a, a basic skeptical insight, that the moment you go about making claims about what is, you're taking something for granted. You're taking something for granted about the knowing you are employing in making claims about what is. What are you taking for granted? Exactly. That, or another way of putting it, you're taking for granted what about your knowing? That it's reliable, that it's authoritative. Yet, how can you be sure? You can't be sure by making claims about what is as a way of establishing the authority of your knowing because you're using your knowing to make those claims. It seems, in other words, that instead of trying to investigate knowing by first turning to the character of what is, by first doing what could be called ontology, ontology being the science of being, of what is, which the ancient Greeks will tend to regard to be what we must first investigate before we can know anything else, for very strong reasons. In other words, ontology will be presented as what philosophy must first engage in, first philosophy. For these moderns, the skeptical insight into how any attempt to read off the character of what is takes for granted the authority of the knowing it employs, that signifies that before we make any claims about what is, we have to first turn to investigate knowing and establish its own authority. <coughs> 
In other words, what comes first in inquiry, what comes first in philosophy, what is first philosophy cannot be ontology, cannot be an investigation of what is. It must be an investigation of knowing. It must be a knowing of knowing. In other words, what is going to be first philosophy? What is the primary science? Epistemology. Epistemology comes first. Now, there's something about this turn which will be presented, in a sense, in the most uncompromising, thoroughgoing way by Kant. That has something problematic about it at, at face value. Because if you're going to turn to epistemology as what must be the foundation of all further knowledge. We must first know what knowing is and establish what it can know before we can make claims about anything else. The question is, how could an investigation of knowing by itself establish the authority of knowledge. Because the authority of knowledge depends upon, in some respect, a correspondence or an adequation between the claims that the knower makes and the character of the object of knowing. Now, if we are turning to investigate knowing because we don't yet have any authority, to determine the character of objects, it might appear that if we turn first to investigate knowing, we have no resource available to measure whether the claims knowing makes have any objectivity, have any match with their objects. Because it's precisely access to the truth of what is that is in question, and it's because it's in question that we're turning to investigate knowing. So how can the investigation of knowing shed light on whether knowing is true? If we're turning to knowing because we can't immediately read off the character of what is? Well, what you're going to see is that the only way in which this turn to investigate knowing as what is primary this turn to make epistemology foundational, to make epistemology be the investigation that has to be undertaken before all others, is if somehow the character of knowing determines the character of the object of knowing. Somehow or other, the structure of knowing must determine what knowing can know. If that's the case, when we turn to investigate knowing, in looking at knowing, we can, in a sense, establish what knowing can know on the basis that the object of knowing will, in some respect, be determined by the structure of knowing. That cognition will itself determine the character of what is knowable. Now, obviously, that kind of move is going to have ramifications for the character of what we can know to be objective. And it might appear that it, it, it leads us to restrict knowing to a knowledge of what is ultimately subjective, what is ultimately just a product of knowing. That in a sense, as Kant would put it, our knowing is going to be restricted to mere appearances. Mere appearances where, in a sense, what we can know about them is what our knowing puts in them. But that's all we can do. So this turn to investigate knowing, in a certain respect, is going to lead to a certain kind of skepticism. And we're going to try, to, we're going to concern ourselves with investigating the nature of this whole effort, which will proceed through different forms. Descartes, in a certain sense, will present an initial way of moving in this direction. Hume will present another. And Kant will then really present the most radical formulation of this whole engagement. So 
No, we in a sense have these two broad fundamental directions for thinking about the character of knowing. One is that we're going to root and found the character of knowing in the character of what is, in the character of being, which must first be investigated. And knowing is to be understood as being grounded and made possible by the very character of what is. The other is to regard epistemology as being foundational, as what must first be investigated, where somehow or other we're going to turn to knowing itself as what we must first investigate. And somehow understand knowing to operate on the basis of a knowing that is able to play a determining role in the character of the object of knowing. Well, we're going to turn in conclusion to what might be regarded as a third alternative, which is one in which one will neither turn to what is or to knowing to try to ground the character of genuine cognition. And it will be based on a kind of skepticism with regard to the whole turn to treat epistemology as what comes first. Because the turn to investigate epistemology as what comes first doesn't want to make claims about what is. It's skeptical about making claims about what is until we've turned to investigate knowing and certified its character. But then when we make this move, what Kant will characterize as a kind of Copernican turn or a transcendental turn to turn to investigate knowing, one still makes claims about the character of knowing from the outset. Are these dogmatic? Are these established? When we turn to investigate knowing as what comes first, and knowing under consideration is the knowing of objects. That's what this foundational epistemology is concerned with, right? We're looking at knowing, where knowing is a knowing of objects. But the knowing we make use of as the foundational epistemologist, as the philosopher who turns to address knowing as the first topic, is engaged in a knowing that is different from the knowing it investigates. How is it different? Well, the knowing that is under scrutiny by Descartes through Kant is a knowing that is a knowing of objects, right? But the knowing that is employed by Descartes through Kant and those who follow in their footsteps is the knowing of knowing. They're different. One is a knowing of objects, different from knowing. The other is a knowing of knowing. So what that tells you is that when we put under scrutiny a knowing of objects, we are not at the same time putting under scrutiny our knowing of knowing. In some respect, the knowing that is employed by the investigator who turns to address knowing as the first topic that must be considered is not being completely critical, not being completely self-critical. They want to engage in a critique of knowing, but they're not putting under critique their knowing of knowing. And the third form of an investigation of epistemology will be something pioneered by Hegel that we will look, look at at the end of our, our journey. And it will call into question both of these two preceding fundamental approaches to epistemology. And I think in working our way through this material, you'll get a sense that in some way we are exhausting the field of possibilities. Are there any questions about this brief sketch I've laid out before you right now, which obviously is, 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 is using terms you may not be familiar with, is sketching things out that are certainly not that uh, uh, easy to lay hold of uh, first time around, but they're the kind of issues we're, we're going to be confronting. I want to say something about the readings in question. <coughs> 
the readings that I selected are among the central works of Western philosophy. And they include sections and substantial sections of what I think you could consider to be the greatest works of human civilization in philosophy. And I'm speaking in particular of Aristotle's metaphysics, Kant's critique of pure reason, Hegel's phenomenology of spirit, and Hegel's science of logic. These works are all extremely challenging. The Plato is also challenging, although it's much more accessible in its way, at least certainly having a kind of literary character. Descartes and Hume are challenging, but in a sense more manageable than either the Aristotle, the Kant, or the Hegel. If you were to think that you could read through this material and achieve anything like a full understanding the first time through or the second time through, you have a highly inflated estimation of your understanding. On the other hand, if you think that these readings, which are among the most difficult ever produced, are readings that you cannot make any sense of whatsoever, then you are cowardly and lazy because there's a challenge here that you can meet and that is worth meeting. And I will do my best to help you. The course, as it's laid out, is going to introduce you to extremely fruitful, important texts. And if you apply yourself, you will learn a tremendous amount about knowledge, about what it is to, to think. And I think it, it will turn out to be well worth the challenge. But I think you have to recognize the material is going to be extremely challenging, extremely demanding. But it's not going to be such that you will have no time for anything else in your life or in your studies. But be aware that uh, what lies ahead of you will be uh, both rewarding and difficult. Now, I should say one other thing about what, what I'm going to be asking of you. I'm going to be asking you to do writing of a character where I'm not interested in having you regurgitate sort of paraphrases of the conclusions of thinkers. This is not a history of ideas class. I'm going to be asking you to try to think through arguments, exercise some kind of critical understanding of them. And generally, I will be asking you to take a kind of Socratic approach. And when I say a Socratic approach, I'll be asking you to look at the arguments we are <coughs> investigating and try to evaluate them on their own terms. I'm not expecting you to have your own positive theory and be in a position to say that, well, what these thinkers are saying is wrong because this is what is true. I'm rather going to be asking you to explore them on their own terms and see whether they're able to achieve what they're setting out to achieve, whether what they're doing uh, is something that is coherent or not. And in asking you to engage in these kind of writings, I'm going to ask you never to use quotations. I want everything in your own words. Because at least then, there's not as, as much ambiguity as to what you think vis-a-vis -vis what uh, the writer of the text may think. And as I said, I will give you the questions weeks, if not a month or more in advance. Uh, you'll have time to look them over, to come and talk to me about your papers. I will not want to look at earlier drafts. I want to see the finished product, but I will be willing to speak to you about uh, the work at hand. Okay. Are there any questions? <coughs>
about what lies before us. Okay, well, look, that's, that's all for today. And uh, make sure for Thursday you've read as much of the Mino as is listed for that date. And if you, if you can, read to the end of it. But we'll primarily be focusing on the part that is, that is listed here.